Thank you. OK, so no pressure here, then. I'm, my job today is to try and make the world of integrated care systems really fun and interesting for you. So that's, that's the challenge. Um, so um, I'm Susanna Howard. Um, for about the last five and a half years, I've been what's been called the programme director for the integrated care system. So I've been there throughout the journey to build, and I'm going to tell you about, a bit about this, an integrated care system locally for Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, I'm a psychologist by background. That might come through a little bit in some of my comments in this because I do observe behaviours and that's a big bit of integrated care systems is about how people behave, how they work together, the relationships in the system. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to take you through um, not just a bit about ICSs and so on and I'm going to try and get you really up to speed so you get really good on getting all these acronyms right in the future. Um, but um, uh, I'm going to also tell you a bit about how really integrated care systems are about thinking very, very differently in the future. Um, and then my colleague Sharon, um, who's um, got a social care background, um, has um, added a couple of slides with some ideas of things to think about in particular around safeguarding, if that's helpful. And then we'll hopefully we'll have time for a chat. So um, that's me. Um, just to say, um, in the new world, as of the 1st of um, July, I will be the director for one piece, of this, which is the, the, the partnership that um, underpins the integrated care system, but I'm going to explain that in just a minute. So, first things first. So, our ICS... Um, oop, let's see, look, there we go. Failed already at the first hurdle. Um, our ICS um, here in Suffolk and North East Essex. So, um, we were actually one of the first systems in the country um, to be called an integrated care system. So, that was actually back in 2018. Our population that we serve... Um, is just over a million people. Now, that actually makes us one of the smaller integrated care systems in the country. Um, if you go to the north of England, you'll find that integrated care systems cover a much bigger geography um, and have possibly more places and complexity. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I don't need to tell any of you that that patch includes significant contrasts, um, different areas, different localities, and that's probably why we were one of the first systems in the country to really move to working at place, and place has been so important to us um, and developing place-based alliances has been an important part of what we've done. The other thing is, is that we, we tend to have a good reputation nationally. Um, I'm going to show you a, pit, uh, a quote in a bit from um, another system um, who also have a good reputation, but we've been one of the systems that's also been very fortunate that we've been able to share our learning nationally. And what I would say is that a lot of the ways of working that are now in the new Health and Care Act, which will um, come into place on the 1st of July, as Anthony said, um, are very, very similar to some of the ways of working that have already evolved locally here. So it's really nice to see what we thought was a good way to do things locally here turn into actually the, the way of working in the legislation. So that's quite nice. The other thing to say is that um, for integrated care systems, a lot of this is about having a kind of, you know, much higher ambition um, and, um, uh, and really a focus on, in particular, health equality. So... What's it all about? Ultimately, this is the way that I like to think about integrated care systems. This is the problem we're trying to solve. And I'm sure it's the problem that all of you think about all of the time as safeguarding practitioners. That what we're trying to do is to move our attention in health and care away from this sort of almost obsession with services and how different agencies interrelate and all the complexity and actually just pay, think about people and think about whether or not when push comes to shove, we're doing the right thing for people. Because, you know, I think really you characterise the last sort of 30 years worth of, you know, developments in health and care as having been about kind of trying to kind of perpetually reconnect all of the pieces into kind of, you know, care pathways and kind of contracts and stuff like that. And, you know, somehow, sometime we're going to come up with this perfect arrangement and it'll all work perfectly for everybody. This is about moving away from, and I'm going to talk about this a lot, very structural, you know, kind of mechanical interpretation of health and care to thinking about health and care as a system. And I'm going to talk a lot about it being a true system. So, um, so collaboration. So um, at the heart of the ICS has basically been a kind of, you know, a, a collaboration. It's a collaboration between, I always think about it as a bit of a golden triangle, all of the different agencies, and there are lots of them, that make up kind of health, NHS and health. So obviously commissioners and NHS providers and primary care and some independent providers and the role of NHS England and so on, and, and, and more. 
Then all of the complexity across local government, which I don't need to say, you know, we've got county councils, we've got district and borough councils, we've got obviously adult social care, children's services, social care providers, public health, we've got all the kind of elected processes and so on, and I could go on. And then equally diverse is our voluntary community and social enterprise sector, who are very important to us as um, a sector here in Suffolk and North East Essex. So, and again, that's diverse. We've got everything from infrastructure organisations like Community Action Suffolk, We've got community funders like Suffolk Community Foundation. There's obviously lots of providers, um, social enterprises, Healthwatch have a very key role in the ICS, and obviously lots of patient public organisations and more. Now, up until now, the collaboration of those agencies here in Suffolk North East Essex has been, to be honest, on an informal basis. I joke about the ICS up until now being like Schrodinger's cat. It kind of exists and doesn't exist at the same time. It exists because everyone talks about it. But actually, technically speaking, it's a partnership. It's just something we agreed to do together, if you like. You know, all of the agencies got together um, and said, we're going to work together through a collaboration. And that's been up until this point. What happens now is that the new Health and Care Bill moves that informal collaboration forward and puts it on a statutory footing. It's going to put it onto a, an official footing, if you like. And there, there is, going forward, a duty to collaborate through integrated care systems on both the NHS and local authorities. Now, I'll be honest, I think for the last five years, it's felt a little bit as if ICSs have been an NHS thing. You know, I, I, I sort of always say that they look like, smell like, behave like the NHS on the whole. And, you know, it's been really, to be honest, kind of, you know, a, a, an ongoing kind of, you know, task to try and make sure that everybody's included in this. I think we've really got an opportunity now to really, um, with the new arrangements, actually have a much more balanced um, arrangement and so on and I'll hopefully show you how that will be the case so the new health and care bill don't worry I'm not going to go through it I'm sure you're all sleeping with a copy under your pillows at night at the moment um, but basically what it's about is it does do a number of things that actually just make it easier for all of the different agencies in health and care to actually collaborate because we know that things like kind of you know competition and commercial kind of side of health and care doesn't really help with that um, we know that there's been lots of kind of barriers and, and so on, which have meant that quite often, you know, when people are reaching out to get support from, you know, the services they need to, they are met with can't do rather than what we want to be, which is can do in terms of how we support people. So the Health and Care Bill does start to build that legislative environment, which is very, very important. It does change some of the fundamental principles that underpin um, the way that health and care works. So we're on this sort of timeline. Yeah. Maybe for colleagues at the back, quite hard to see the text. Okay. Would you be happy to send out the presentation? Yeah, I can afterwards? send some stuff later. Yeah. Then people don't have to take notes. And yeah. can, thank you. Yeah, yes, but much better overviews than that. I was just saying, I wasn't going to read it all through. But <laughs> so, um, so we're on a, a, a kind of transition timeline. We actually started work on um, the, the health and care bill's been going through parliament for the last year it actually got royal assent uh, end of april towards the end of april and during that there were a number of amendments it was sort of debated particularly in the house of lords in quite some detail there were some really good debates and challenges around it so it's been going through but whilst it's been going through obviously there's needed to be some work um, put in place um, to make sure that you know because there's not much notice i can tell you between the end of april and the first of july um, to, to have everything in place. So, the, um, so we've been prepping, if you like, um, for, for implementing um, the bill. Um, and um, as I said, on the, at midnight, on the 30th of... Um, is it the 30th of June? Yes, the 30th of June, um, a number of things will stop. So, for example, we will not have CCGs anymore. We won't have clinical commissioning groups. They won't be responsible. Um, they won't exist anymore. And um, from the 1st of July... Um, for example, I'll explain this responsibility for the NHS budget for the population will be managed by a different body, um, which is a NHS, it will be called NHS Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, so that's what happens on the 1st of July. Um, we in Suffolk, we like a party, don't we? So we thought it would be really good to actually, you know, yes, we've got to do some formal things on the 1st of July. Those boards need to meet officially for the first time. But we're really excited about this new opportunity because this really takes us forward in the way we want to work as an ICS. So we're going to be having a big event at Newmarket. I put the thing up at the beginning. You are all very, very welcome. We've already got more than 500 people registered to come. Um, so we're having an event called Expo um, at Can Do Health and Care Expo at Newmarket Racecourse 
um, on the 1st of July. And that's basically to kind of celebrate all the ways that we're working um, together more across the, uh, the system. The other thing to mention is that actually, um, once we've kind of got over the line of the 1st of July, things don't let up because by December, we need to put in place our first integrated care strategy. And that will be the role of the ICP, which is um, obviously the bit of the system that I will lead. So, we've been doing all this work around prepping. We've got a design framework. Again, I'm happy to send you this if you're, if you're interested. It's a bit of a long read, and it is the bit that Anthony said people wouldn't be interested, which is all the kind of governance bits and stuff like that. It's all those things. We've had to have those conversations, and I'll tell you a bit about them, but just so you've got some familiarity. But there is a design framework, but basically, this is always, you know, you're never going to fix it. You know, we've always got to kind of look at... Yesterday, I was in a meeting where we were, like, going, well, look, this is something we know is the right thing to do, how do we now make the arrangements we've got work for us? So we need to continue to evolve ways of working as a system going forward. So the million-dollar question, how does all this stuff get organised? How do you organise an integrated care system? I've shown you the diversity of all of the partners and all of these different things. How do you organise all of this? Now, I think that we've now got an opportunity to actually do this the right way. So rather than the attempts that we've had in the past, which have been sort of one-size-fits-all, very top-down, cookie-cutter, you know, ways of reorganising health and care. This time, it's going to be the perfect way it's going to work. What the Health and Care Act does is it does give local flexibility, so there's some common features for all integrated care systems, um, but actually, there will be some differences. We can tailor the way that we work for our local circumstances, and also different systems will move at different speed. So basically it gives us the opportunity to give a complex answer to actually a complex um, uh, problem, basically. So, I don't know why this isn't working. So, um, system structure charts. So everybody asks me for this, right? They say, so Susanna, I could probably get an email about every two days saying, Susanna, can you send me the ch structure chart for the ICS? And I say, absolutely, I'll send it through. Here it is. This is the system structure chart and so on. And I don't know if you've been to any meetings that look like this, because what you tend to see is that when you're faced with all of that mind-boggling complexity, because actually, I mean, I, in another talk that I give, I talk about the fact that health and care is, is infinite. You know, the issues that drive people's health and well-being, you can never get your arms around every single agency that's relevant to that. So, you know, I know that when you're faced with all that complexity, there's a big temptation for people to get together in rooms and have meetings that look a bit like this. And everyone gets in the room and says, right, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a structure about who's going to report to what and everything. I've got one bit of advice. If you get invited to a meeting like that, don't go, run away, don't participate, because you will never do it, because this is about working as a system. It's not about working through a mechanical set of structures and so on anymore. We need to work systemically. Hierarchies are not for systems. You know, I challenge you and say, well, which bit's most important, you know, for anybody? Because for any one individual... It's actually the collaboration and it's the, the collective effort of different agencies, different bits of the system that are going to drive their health and well-being. So, you need to think about how systems are organised. If you think about systems, think about like ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef or think about the human body as a system. When you kind of have a look at them, um, they look a bit messy. I can tell you, if you cut me in half, it looks messy. But um, if you lean into a system, you tend to be able to pick out that there are certain features, certain bits of the system that have different functions. So, you know, if you take certain bits of the Great Barrier Reef out, we know this, don't we, then there's a bit of a problem. That ecosystem doesn't work anymore. And the human body has lots of different organs, and those different organs all have a very important and necessary function, but they all do something different. And obviously as a system, things flow between them. So I want you to think about, and just always remember that we're talking about an integrated care system, OK? So this is our integrated care system. These are the kind of organs in our integrated care system. And um, I'm going to give it to Sharon to see if she can get it to work. Um, <laughs> so, um, so these are the organs. So the first thing is, I mentioned um, that CCGs will go. What the Health and Care Act does is it will bring in the from the 1st of July, the responsibility for managing the NHS budget for the population of Suffolk and North East Essex will be with um, a new body, a new type of body. Um, its public name will be NHS Suffolk and North East Essex. That's its new logo. And um, it is referred to as an integrated care board. Okay? It has a very specific role as an organ in the system, which is basically that responsibility, which is a huge responsibility, to um, oh perfect um, to um, to manage the the, um, 
uh, uh, NHS budget for the um, population. The second thing that the Act puts into place is then an integrated care partnership. And the two things are very, very different, and I'm going to go back to this several times. But basically, the partnership is a statutory partnership now. Do you remember that duty to collaborate? Between the NHS and... Well, it's, it's basically between all of the partners in the system, but the, the responsibility to make sure there is a partnership is equally, and it is equally, between that NHS body and the upper-tier local authorities, the county councils. Okay, so they jointly convene and equally convene that partnership going forward. So basically, those are two new bits of statutory stuff, if you like, going on. One of them is a body, because, of course, the um, new N NHS ICB, as it's been called, but I just call it NHS Suffolk and North East Essex, it's so much easier, um, is um, an organisation. Ed Garrett is the chief executive of that. Going forward, it has a board. I'm going to show that in a minute and so on. Um, but the other thing is a partnership. So um, for me as the director of the partnership, if you like, we're, we just have a small secretariat that works equally across um, particularly local government and the NHS to put the partnership in place. Now, those two bits of statutory, kind of new statutory things, sit alongside also this, which do continue. We still have statutory health and wellbeing boards. So in actual fact, we have three statutory mechanisms in the ICS going forward. Now, the other thing is that, of course, you know, this is our patch. We talked about place-based working. So we have three place-based alliances. Now, these are not yet... I'm going to tell you a bit about this in a minute, but they're not statutory things yet. They're, they're, they're kind of informal. Um, but they're really important because all the way through the Act, it emphasises the need to work for subsidiarity, as it's called, continue to try and work at place um, increasingly. And we're really in a good place with this in, in Suffolk. We've got really well-developed already place-based alliances. And then there are other organs. I won't go on about them for hours, but we've got things like, you know, um, formal collaboratives forming between particularly NHS providers where they can work more collaboratively, like mental health providers across the east of England who provide specialist services. Um, our voluntary community social enterprise sector leaders have been working together on um, how, again, they can be more collaborative and also um, uh, how we can uh, make sure that they have that equality of voice um, through um, the ICS. We've got um, a chairs group, which is very key in the system, which brings together the non-executive um, chairs and also some key elected members um, uh, around uh, governance. And then thinking more locally, um, other ways of working are things like integrated neighbourhood teams and primary care networks. They're all different organs. They all do different things. They all bring different parts. But essentially, these are all platforms, if you like, for partners to come together and work together um, on different key things. Now, that's lots of organs. Basically, the integrated care system is all of that, OK? So if somebody says to you, oh, it's the ICB stroke ICS, it's not, you know, that kind of thing. Probably the nearest thing is it's the partnership, if you like, which is underpins the system. And the other thing to remember is what I said about hierarchy is a not for system. So, you know, these different things interlink. They need to interlink, and people do need to flow between them because, you know, the thinking around strategy in one place might inform delivery somewhere else, for example. So the interlinking between those is right and appropriate because we're a system. Now, one of the temptations around this is that at the moment I keep hearing people going, so the new NHS, Suffolk and Northfield, that's, the, that's just the CCG, isn't it? And you're like, no. The whole point of the legislation is to create a different type of NHS body. Or isn't an ICS now just a new strategic health authority? And you're like, no. Now, I actually saw this guy, who's um, Rob Webster. He's a bit of a rock star in ICS world. He's uh, really well known. If you look at anything ICS, he's always got Rob Webster's picture on it. He's much more famous than us. But basically, Rob Webster, I spotted this in the HSJ. He said this last week, and I thought it summed it up really well. He said, he said, a number of people have said to me, you're the new strategic health authority, aren't you? At last, ministers can tell someone what to do. You can tell trusts what to do, and we'll get things done by pulling levers at Whitehall. He said, that's not what we're doing. Integrated care systems are true partnerships of the NHS, local government, communities and third sector. They're focusing on issues about local people, local choices, local determinants of health. He says they're not like anything that's gone before. They're a novel construct and a novel world where things are really changing. He said to take away all your perspectives, all of the patterns people want to put on things so we understand them, this isn't the way we're going to work. And the way I describe it is don't reinvent the flat tyre. Don't try and think, you know, we know the way we work at the moment doesn't work that well for everybody it needs to so why would we basically try and make shape the opportunity we've been given to come up with really the same thing again that would be a missed opportunity so
So just back to this difference between the ICB and the ICP. So as I said, the integrated care partnership is that equal partnership. So the ICB is a partner around the table. So are the county councils and districts and boroughs and public health and social care providers and lots of others. I'll show you the full membership in a minute because it's bigger than I've got the number of circles. Um, but um, it's an equal partnership between all members and, and it's the job, as I said, of um, the county councils and the NHS um, body to convene it. And that's different to the ICB. And the ICB, the reason it's a different thing to the CCGs is what we've now got is an NHS body responsible for the NHS budget that has brought partners around the table to be there alongside and part of the process around how um, uh, uh, the NHS budget is spent. So in our system, there are eight partners around the board. So this is that ICB thing but in a different way. This is the board makeup that we've agreed here in Suffolk and North East Essex. And I just want to point out one thing to you, which is if you look on the left-hand side, and it says 16 times 16 board members, those are the people with votes, OK? And if you look at the number of votes, I'll tell you the answer. Basically, if you count them up, eight of the votes are from partners. So there's as many votes around the table for our new ICB from partners as there are from actual non-executive and executive members of the ICB. So it is a very much more partnership animal um, than we've had previously. So that's important. And the other thing that the ICB has done, which I think is just so exciting, is we've had a really good conversation about that issue about subsidiarity, about where can we try and move decision-making about budgets and things like that to a more local level? Because I think everybody agrees that the more localised you can make that decision-making, the better job we can do around partnership and the better job we can do around collaboration. So you can't read this. Sorry, you, you would, I'm not, I didn't put this up to read. But just to tell you that there is a great big thing called a functions and decisions map, but basically what that's doing is quite often it's trying to, to delegate literally power and responsibility to a much more local level, which is really, really exciting. And so what that's meant is that we've needed to, to do some things to kind of take further forward our local alliances. So, you know, we've made a good start on alliances, but actually now what we've got are both non-executive members and a director in each of our alliances who are jointly appointed by both the NHS and local government, which is really exciting, because that now starts to give us the opportunity to think about, you know, more creative ways we can collaborate at place. And that puts us in SNE a little bit ahead of this, which is that in February there was a publication of something called, people call it the Integration White Paper, um, but this document came out in um, February. And the important bit in this is basically it talks about the fact that by spring 2023, all places, and for us we call our places alliances, in an ICS should have a governance model that basically features a single person so that everyone agrees that we've got a single point, if you like, that, that, of reference. And that will enable, what, this is out of that white paper, um, I could tell you about it in more detail if you want, but basically it will enable pools and align budgets locally. And that, that really starts to kind of create the potential to do something different. So, integrated care partnership, back to that. Um, lots of partners on the table and an equal partnership is really key because it's the job of the partnership, it's partners together that need to have consensus and agree an overall strategy, something called an integrated care strategy for the population. And that strategy needs to be a true strategy. It needs to actually be strategic, and I'm going to say a lot about that in a minute. And basically, it's that strategy that will then drive the plans, delivery plans for the interest integrated care board and the um, upper tier local authorities or county councils and the alliances and so on. So everyone gets together equally, if you like, around this partnership to agree a strategy that then um, everybody goes away and says, right, I'm going to implement this. This will inform the way that we make decisions about how we spend money, that kind of thing. Now, this is where it gets interesting because you sit there and you go, well, how do you have a conversation about strategy? How do you get everyone together on the same page? And We've been kind of thinking about this for some time, and we came up with, you might have heard us talking about this in the ICS, this idea about thinking differently. And thinking differently is basically kind of short for trying to think together as a system with people at the centre of our conversation rather than getting together and having an awkward conversation about services and stuff like that. It's about those sorts of conversations. So you'll start to see, if you go on our website for the ICS, you'll see lots of reports of thinking differently together, events, that kind of thing, We've brought lots of partners together to, to think about specific um, issues. So the job of the ICP, I think, is about driving that thinking to be different across systems. So thinking is about collaboration, lived experience, that's informed by evidence and data, 
and also that actually genuinely focuses on outcomes. So there's lots of ways that we might that we're probably going to do that, which I won't dwell on now, but it's about things like system learning, it's about making sure that um, uh, strategy is driven by need, um, it's about making sure that um, we have really good collaborative networks across lots of different groups. So the ICP, if you like, who's around the table with this? This is going to be the biggest table ever. I don't know how many people in this room, but um, I was just thinking this to myself, um, because at the moment I'm on about 63. Okay, so I'm literally about to write out um, to ask for nominations to the ICP. Some of them are specific, and actually there is a role for the safeguarding chairs for both Suffolk and Essex on that list, because basically what the ICP does, it needs to bring around the table a lot more in terms of professional lived ex um, experience, lived experience, um, those sorts of things. So that's a big bit of, of who will be there around the table. Um, I'm at 63, and um, the other email I get every 10 minutes is telling me to add another five people to it at the moment. So to finish off with, and I'm going to hand over to Sharon, the other thing I just wanted to talk about was, so how are we going to work? How are we going to work in this partnership to agree strategy? And that's where we need to kind of really be quite careful. Remember my comment about let's not reinvent the flat tyre. Um, you know, everyone throws around, you know, I've written a strategy, and um, my favourite game at the moment is that's not a strategy. It's not a strategy because it's not... It, you can't explain to an ordinary mortal what it is that basically this is about. Because ultimately, this is a problem we're trying to solve. If we basically keep just coming up as a health and care system and say that our strategy is basically to have a bigger and more complicated health and care system, that's not a strategy. What people want to see is a strategy about how we're going to improve the health and well-being of the population. And we'll only know if we're collectively, if all of those partners are all doing the right things, if that's driving benefits for the local population. So what we've got to do is we've really got to understand this issue we call about benefits. So um, basically, benefits, if you like, we can use data. And I can see lots of indicators and stuff around, you know. Um, and um, so and I was saying to, to Marion, we were outside, we were chatting beforehand, and I said, look, you know, um, if I stopped somebody halfway around Sainsbury's and said, you know, what, what do you want for your health and care system? They're not going to say, well, what I'd like to see is a 5% reduction, uh, uh, reduction in years lived with disability or whatever it is. You know, that might be indicate. What they'll say is, I want, you know, my children to have the best start in life. I want, you know, um, to, I'm really worried about my sister who's living with long COVID now. Those sorts of things. I'm worried about my husband who's got diabetes. You know, those sorts of things. That's, those are the things people are talking about. So we've got to start to really understand the story around things because data on its own can be quite dangerous, actually, because we can pursue one kind of data point. So this looks a bit complicated. Do not try and read this, right? This is for the purpose of demonstration only, right? But basically, we've got a methodology called outcome-based accountability at the heart of the way we work, which is about making sure that at the top here, we talk about outcomes and benefits of the population. And that's the think drive strategy. So in this one, I'll read it to you. At the top, it says the outcome is that we want everyone in Suffolk and North East Essex to stay well. And if you narrow your lens down, you might say, well, actually, and that includes people with diabetes. We want people with diabetes to stay well. And actually, let's come up with four benefits. So what we're going to aim to do is to help people to avoid diabetes, reverse their diabetes, make sure they get best care, and avoid complications. And the things we're going to measure are things like amputation rates or admissions to hyperglycemia or, you know, um, type 2 conversion or whatever it is. They might be some things that we might measure. Because if those things went down, then we might know that we're doing the right things. And then down the bottom here, deliberately kind of in separate colour colour, is all the things that we're thinking about doing in different places and different ways in the system that we think will make a contribution to driving, moving the needle on the stuff at the top. That is basically in one minute, a two and a half hour course on the OBA. Um, so basically, it's about making sure that, you know, we're checking all the time whether or not what we're all doing collectively in health and care is actually moving the needle. And um, that's really important because you need to go back to that image I showed you at the start about um, you know, moving away from thinking about services all the time to thinking about people. Now, that thing about the story, because that's the bit that you've got to get right then. So the biggest bit of strategy what you've got to do is around the story. Now, the great thing about integrated care systems is you end up with lots of rooms, as I showed you, lots of organs, where people come together from lots of different agencies, and that's great, because we get all these different perspectives around the table, don't we? We get all these different views, we get all of this different input. 
which is fantastic, except that if we really want to understand what's driving people's health and well-being, then we need a lot more perspectives as well. We've really got to think. And I have to say, I'm really excited that, you know, Safeguard is going to be, um, have a, a role around the integrated care partnership because, if you like, I think this might be the world that you understand and live in because these are the things that, that are driving outcomes for individuals. So I'll give you an example. We had a, um, a big conversation recently in the system around long COVID. We know that all of a sudden we've got lots of people, haven't we, living locally with long COVID. Now, there was originally a bit of a kind of NHS England kind of strategy. This is the bit we're going to do about clinical service. But we showed that and, um, you know, the feedback we had from Healthwatch was it's not really addressing the issues people are raising. So we had a good conversation around this where we had... Lots of people live with long COVID in the room. We had some academics, clinicians, um, uh, voluntary community sector partners, lots of different partners. Healthwatch chaired it. It was great. And it's written up. It's on our website. You can go and have a look at it. Sharon wrote it up. It's her work. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. And what's really clever about it is it then summarised at the end. It said, what are the four things? How would we know? What are the benefits that we need to put in place to the population if we're going to do a good job of helping people with long COVID live well with that long COVID? And we came up with four headings, which were people wanted to be believed. They wanted, when they met, you know, went, had contact with healthcare, they wanted to be believed. People wanted to be informed. And that information wasn't just information about services. People said, I'd like to be able to meet, reach out and meet other people who are living along COVID. You know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of information I want. They wanted support. Again, clinical support, but also support welfare and jobs and stuff like that. Um, and also, we want to know that we're learning. As a system, we need to be learning as we go along, because this is new and so on. So the way you do that through our kind of, don't worry, it won't look, it'll look better than this, I promise you. Um, but basically, is that that's how you drop those things in. So in starting to think about our strategy for long COVID, what we're trying to do is make sure that people are believed, supported, informed, and we're learning. That's what we're trying to do. And I think I could probably just about sell that to somebody halfway around Sainsbury's. I think, you know, that's important because that will help us then flush out all the different things people can offer through integration, if you like, in terms of helping enable that to happen. And some of those things will be by, for example, fantastic work with the Citizens Advice Bureau or what Public Health can offer into this or what, you know, ESNEF's fantastic Snellcast service or, um, you know, what GPs can do and so on. There's lots of ways we can do that. And that's a piece of work that Sharon's leading at the moment around developing strategy there. The other thing I just want to drop into here is that we need to make sure that in all of this, we absolutely weave equality. So I do lots of talks where about um, health inequalities with pictures of Raspberry Ripple. So we, uh, we've got a Raspberry Ripple strategy for health equality, um, health equality through the ICS because we know that treating everyone equally does not lead to equality. If we offer everyone the same thing, we won't get the, everyone won't get the same outcomes. So the other kind of big bit of our strategy, if you like, and our thinking in the ICS needs to be about thinking about not just equality, but equity and justice. And those are difficult topics and difficult issues. And the way we frame that is to begin to get into that through ideas around consistency of equality and health and equality impact assessment, building allyship, true allyship um, uh, at every level, awareness and accountability as well. We've been doing that. Um, uh, in a number of ways with um, involving lived experience facilitators and so on to try and take that forward. And that's because we want to avoid this story. So here's a little story, and I want to see if you recognise it. And it's about four people named anybody, everybody, somebody and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realised that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. How many times do you basically play that story out? That's the story we need to avoid. So, leading integrated care, I think, can feel like nailing jelly to a wall. Because if you're going to lead a system, then you're not going to do it through a hierarchy. You're going to need to do it in a different way. We need to do it through kind of persuasion. And that's why this outcome-based thinking is really important. We need to get people out of the services, if you like, and around the people. And we need to have that approach that starts with why. And the why needs to be about outcomes and ambitions, and it needs to be about benefits of people and so on. And that's the framework around which we need to build strategy. So I won't go into detail of this because it is more detail, but just to show you that that's basically that how, why, how, what is that, that process about how we build strategy. So we build strategy by thinking about our ambitions, 
really understanding the story and really leaning into those issues about everyone, about that issue around equality and so on, and, and articulate benefits, benefits that people can understand halfway around Sainsbury's. Based on that, we need to think about how you could turn the curve, how could we implement, you know, how could we deliver those benefits, how could they be enabled? And there might be different ways to do that. And we need to do all of that before everyone gets together to decide what different contributions the NHS or voluntary community sector or local government are going to make through different forums. That's how you do strategy, it's how you do delivery. So in the future, population strategy, planning and delivery will look like this. It will be population need will be led by things like the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment and public engagement stuff. Health Watch have got a statutory role in the ICS. Strategy will be basically that integrated care strategy and also the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which Health and Wellbeing Boards are responsible for. Based on that, we'll deliver plans for things like the NHS, alliances, local government and so on. And those delivery plans by providers and so on should be based on that. Now, I've talked a lot. I could talk more. There's a huge amount more about bits of complexity, different organs, things like that, but I'm not going to. But as I said, you're welcome to have a look at that um, side deck if you want to. But I'm going to now hand over to Sharon, who's just got a couple of thoughts about safeguarding before, um, Hi, if we've got time for a chat. Susanna, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. So um, I think it's really relevant if I ask it now. So we've got some um, from the live stream. Just asking, is lower stuffed in the partnership? No. So there was a big conversation. It's really difficult. I mean, I think, to be honest, the boundaries around integrated care systems. So the footprint for the ICS um, is um, West Suffolk, Ipswich and East Suffolk and North East Essex. There was a review in 2021 that looked at um, uh, whether or not, when the, we moved to statutory arrangements, we might have a coterminous boundary with, with the, the counties, basically. And the decision by the Secretary of State was to leave the boundaries as they are. So Waveney, um, the area around low stuff, is, is part of the system with Norfolk and Waveney. But the one thing that is in our design framework, and there genuinely is a very good working relationship with the Norfolk and Waveney system and Suffolk and North East Essex. So, my watch talking. So, um, so it's not. It's part of the Norfolk and Waveney system. But actually, to be honest, I'm quite often in conversations about Waveney as well. Great, thank you. And just one of the other ones was: Is the DWP one of your one of like the key players or partners? So the other thing, and I haven't gone into detail about this, but I can talk about it, is that what we've agreed to do, and it's partly because of those boundaries, is that our Health and Wellbeing Board. Is a, really, is, is, is a really good forum around those wider determinants of health stuff. So the work we need to do with things like the Chamber of Commerce and local economic partnership and employers and education, we're going to do that through the Health and Wellbeing Board with health and care at the table as a partner. But actually, that's where we need to, you know, really kind of have that broader view. So um, not in the ICP, um, but actually um, the ICP then joins up with um, the, the wide world and the health through the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Yeah, that was just a couple from our online um, attendees. And there are a couple of other questions which we'll come to at the end. Cool. The Thank group. you. Oh, do, I press, do I hold the mic thing in? Yeah, you can talk. Am I talking? Oh, yeah. fantastic. Right. Um, oh, so it's 20 to 1. I, at 10 to 1, you have lunch. Um, I know full well through a long history of teaching, training, all sorts of things, that what you don't do is interfere with lunch. So we will finish in 10 minutes' time, I promise you. Um, but um, so, so my name's Sharon Rhodey. I work with Susanna. Um, I'm a social worker by profession. Um, I've been in academia as well. Um, I started, I suppose, I've been in social work since 1994. Um, 20 years ago, I was um, complaints manager for adult social care in Essex. That was fun. Um, and, but since then, I've been involved in um, uh, reviews, audits, quality audits, um, all sorts of things, including um, I've worked um, uh, in, with input into reviews and also um, as an author for safeguarding adult reviews and safeguarding children reviews. And I think we've got some children's representatives here, so I'm really pleased to see that. So um, I was just going to really highlight, back on the back of what Susanna said, uh, a couple of things that I think are opportunities. And uh, that won't take me that long, so if there's any thoughts, please do shout, chip in. I, have, I am mobile. I can walk, so we could hopefully... This will travel around there if we need to. So, 
I think that this new framework that we've got, the statutory framework, gives us opportunities for safeguarding board in several ways. So in, in terms of learning from when things go wrong, um, I know what we, we tend to do is um, uh, you, you, you get a report, an investigation, individual agencies do their IMRs, you do your overarching report, um, there's a set of recommendations, they go from the safeguarding boards out and we hope that at some point um, all those actions that are decided are going to be uh, actioned and they're kind of reported back in and, um, sorry, I moved my hands a lot, so that's not good with the mic, is it? Sorry. Um, so we report, uh, people report back in about what they've done and you kind of hope it makes a difference. But we also, I think, have the opportunity to have um, input at a strategic level. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, I've not long finished doing um, a report on a gentleman who literally drank himself to death. And he was very, very well known to ambulance services, police, um, fire, um, hospital services, mental health, drug and alcohol, all sorts of services. Now, there's a great thing that's coming through called Changing Futures, I want to say. I think that's what it is. The, the, the new, there's a new national um, drive for people with all those things on criminal justice system as well he was involved in. So that's great, but that will help a few people. But there are an awful lot of people, I'm sure you can all think immediately of quite a few people that you've worked with who come under some or all of those categories. What we don't do... I don't think, as nationally, not locally, but nationally, what we don't do is really take that learning from what goes wrong with individuals and with families and, and input that into strategy. So with the ICP, the partnership, we have the opportunity to influence at a strategic level um, and also obviously the wider health and wellbeing strategies as well, the health and wellbeing boards. We also then when you devise your action plans um, with local organisations, as I say, you know, sometimes things happen um, that, that make a real difference. Sometimes there's a little bit of action, sometimes there's not very much. It kind of varies. But we have the opportunity through collective planning by the ICB and by wider partners um, and through the delivery of those action plans, actually, at, um, in our alliances, which is our place level. So we have a place that is West Suffolk, a place that is Ipswich and East Suffolk, and a place that's North East Essex. Um, if, if changes are to be made in those particular areas rather than everywhere, there's an opportunity for that to happen. So we have that opportunity to, to really devise some better action plans, have system action plans, and actually through those um, networks, through those alliances and so on, through the system and the ICB, we can actually hold each other to account for those things to make sure they really happen. And the other thing that Susanna's talked to about, um, the, the, the different ways that we work, I think can also contribute. So, as Susanna said, we have an out outcomes-based approach. Our focus is on outcomes for people, not outputs for organisations. Um, another example um, I was saying earlier, you know, very often when I do reviews, um, training often comes out of that. So the, um, the need for training in a particular issue will come out of a, a, a report. And, and that training may happen. What we never really know is what change that's made. Has that prevented what went wrong with that person or that family? Has that really helped? So an outcome-based approach by maintaining a focus on, on people and whether people feel safer or are safer rather than organisations ticking a box that everybody's gone on a training course, that will mean that quality and the concepts of personalisation it stays at the heart of what we do. Why should you go on that training? What difference is that going to make? Thinking differently, those, those bringing people together events that we do, but also outside of that, means that we can learn from each other. Um, and it's brilliant to see everybody here today. I don't think there are enough forums like this uh, with so many organisations represented. So we can explore how we can make a difference together as a system. And Andrew was just talking about you, people presenting things they're doing. And, um, 
that that's a really good opportunity across agencies. And, and what we're doing is, is pretty much that in a slightly different way. Um, and our commitment to health equity means that we're inclusive. So we do focus on the most marginalised, like the gentleman I was talking about. Um, I remember another review um, I did of, uh, for another local authority about a child who'd been sexually abused by a sibling, which is an increasing issue for those, I think, of you who work with children. And um, one of the recommendations I, I made was around a lifelong approach. So the, the experiences that that little girl had gone through are going to affect. Let's all acknowledge it's going to affect her for the rest of her life. So we shouldn't have that d division between children and adult services. We should, um, a school nurse, a teacher, should be able to talk to that child or, when she's a young person as, uh, about her needs and about her understanding of relationships and what good relationships are. And then if she has periods of... Um, distress or mental health issues when she gets older, she should be able to seek that help, but not in a siloed way, in a way that understands the complexity of her needs. And she's not on her own. There'll be, there are a lot of these children, as we know. So we need to focus on those most marginalised and we need to give them a voice. And what we're hoping, what we're planning, is that those marginalised voices will have... Um, the opportunity to be heard within our system. And I'm not going to go around because it's two minutes to ten to. But can I just ask if you've got any particular thoughts? Does that resonate? Does that sound like it could be an opportunity for you to have an input into that? Has anybody got anything they wanted to comment? Just shout, put your hands up, whatever appeals. Any thoughts? Andrew, have you got any particular thoughts? Yeah. So we've got one question that says, will, will this include the new way of working and offers in relation to mental health treatment requirements? It would, it would cover everything. It would cover mental health, physical health. It would cover geographies it, within our patch. We only have control over our patch. But as Susanna says, we work closely with Norfolk and Waveney because there shouldn't be a postcode lottery between whether you're in Waveney or outside Waveney. Um, so th that is one thing we're keen on um, ensuring we don't, we, we don't miss. Uh, but yeah, it would include everything. And I think it includes that in what we talk about intersectionality. You know, people have mental health problems and they have housing problems and they have, you know, difficulty seeing their GP and they have problems with antisocial behaviour locally. Or what, you know, we need to look at these everybody holistically. term condition um, feel well around mental health um, probably something around um, aging well and um, and end of life as well so Great. that's sort of think about those as overall outcomes and then we'll work downwards you. yeah and one of the other questions um, I don't have a lot of context but it says will will this increase the current postcode lottery of services does that um so um that's a really good kind of question really I suppose I mean I don't think it's about a, a postcode lottery. I think that we need to think about equity around this. So, you know, in actual fact, if you think about services, it might be that for particular communities, if you think about equity, we need to do more um, in terms of outreach. And so we learned this with, you know, for example, the vaccination program was a fantastic model of how just offering the same thing out in one model to the population was not going to get us the same outcome. So I think um, that focus on health equity and actually health and equality, if you like, might mean that we're doing different things for different communities and different populations, but for very good reasons. What we need to move to is equity of outcome rather than equity of service. I, I, I would agree. I think we've, we've too much... We've, um, we, historically, there's been this service is available here, but that it's not available there. That sort of postcode lottery is not acceptable. But having this type of service that targets these, this particular community or particular population, that's appropriate because that's responding to their needs. Great. But we shouldn't have we shouldn't have situations where there's nothing. You know, deserts. That that should never happen. And the other thing I'd say to you is that don't forget what I've talked about about subsidiarity. And I talked a bit about place, but also think about neighbourhood. So if you've got that focus on very local communities, then you're thinking about, in terms of postcodes, 
actually, you know, it's not that you're looking across such a big area that you, your eye's just drawn to the one main urban central area. You've actually got kind of... We're devolving budgets down to very late local neighbourhood levels so that those decisions can be made at a much more local level. So I think mm -hmm. the subsidiarity um, issues around here are really important. And we're very conscious, particularly, that Suffolk has some urban areas, but an awful lot of rural areas. So those thing, issues about rural deprivation, um, about, you know, lack of public transport, lack of access to services, we're very conscious of. And there's a lot happening in, in those localities, in those villages in particular. Thanks. Is there any more? No, that's all from online. Lovely. So if there's any... Yes, please. our boundary slightly so when I was making referrals for those families that was just slightly over our boundary but into in our new boundary the referrals that I was making to hospitals um, and things like that they weren't accepting them so then I had to refer to the other side of the boundary and they were kind of nobody wanted to take responsibility for them and I found that a real problem because their ser the services they needed were getting delayed so will that be resolved where and which type of team so I missed the very health big visitor Health visiting. Yeah. Um, so health visiting will be, is, is, will be part of those integrated neighbourhood teams. So what you'll be able to do is have um, those conversations locally. And they're multi-agency, so it's integrated because they are multi-agency. And they should have representatives from the hospitals within there as well. Um, and you'll be able to have those conversations to ensure that, that you, you don't have, you know, inappropriately... Refer referrals refused to you and and the have those conversations and yeah you know tried to solve it out but it was a real problem because it delayed referrals for speech and language and right. know, pediatricians and things like that and speech was, and language it, has got huge it was small resources villages that nobody wanted to kind of right and and the thing is is that if you build integrated teams and you build relationships between people with integrated mm. teams and so on then in actual fact they're much more likely to be able to solve those problems because they're, the person you're dealing with is part of your team, part of the group that you work with. And with an issue like a boundary and so on, once you've resolved that once or twice and so on, you know what your workaround is around that. The other thing is, is actually, I mean, everyone can get very held up on boundaries. You're never going to find a perfect boundary, let me tell you. But what you can do is a lot of the flexibility. Remember what I said about the health and care legislation changing? It it reduces, if you like, that competition, you know, that it's not in my contract and you know, all of that kind of stuff. It does really put us in the zone of, you know, one of the reasons why we always use, you know, can-do health and care was that's what people want. Yeah. They want the can-do. What you're describing is people wanting the can-do, not the, not my job, not my job, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's yeah. the job. That's the job. And the last thing I'd say about that is it's, this is not just a task in Suffolk and North East Essex. It's not just in England. Virtually every place on the planet is trying to come up with integrated care because... You know, people living longer, they've got more complex health needs. We've got so much complexity in health and care everywhere around the globe. You've got to find a way to get all those bits to work together. So, you know, this is a global movement around integrated care when you get really into it. And, um, you know, it's really about solving problems just like the ones that you're describing. So thank you. And our focus is just because you are I'm now five minutes into your lunch hour. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Is that... Um, and for all of you, you know, we need um, to make sure that the voices of people... It's your frustration, but it's that family that's living with that yeah, delay is the issue. Mm. We need to... All of you need to advocate for your patients, uh, your service users, to make sure that that lived experience of having to sit and wait while other people argue, that's mm. what we need to make sure is heard. And the Integrated Care Partnership is a good way of doing that. Um, but it needs to happen at all levels as well. So make sure that you shout for your, your people as well. Make sure their voices are heard through whatever forums you can. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much, Susanna and Sharon.